I'm Enrico Asher, the vice chair of the V Symposium, and I am in between two of the most important giants in vascular surgery. It's an historical moment for me because not everyone would have the opportunity to be sitting close to the two of the best educators in vascular surgery. To my right, I have Dr. Juan Parodi, who is a legend and who has directed our specialty in a path that has been very successful and moved us from doing open surgery only to endovascular because he, with his motivational uh, presentations and, and new ideas and great techniques, uh, particularly regarding uh, carotid uh, surgery and carotid interventions, as well as aortic aneurysm, uh, as you know. On my left, I have Dr. Veet, who is probably the most important vascular surgeon in the United States, and he has been a major contributor with over a thousand scientific papers, all, most of them extremely clinically re relevant to our practice, and he has been uh, my mentor for so many years. So it is a very important moment for me, but I'm gonna take this opportunity to basically get them to talk to us about how this whole revolution in vascular surgery started. So we're going to start with Dr. Parodi, who had this ingenious idea of developing an endograft for the repair of aortic aneurysm. Dr. Parodi, how this whole thing started, briefly? Uh, I was a young resident at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, I thought I am probably in the best place uh, for vascular surgery in America and the surgeons are first class, the care is good. But I was seeing complication after complication, and that was in 1976. One day, uh, I was in the operating room, and we had two consecutive bad outcomes. I am learning how to do Seldinger technique, and I'm thinking that uh, perhaps we can do this on the local, percutaneously, and the patient can go home the following day with a new artery introduced by the groin and fixed uh, with the metal frame. He, said, he told me, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you been drinking today? <laughs> I made two rings, a compressible, and uh, with two bridges, and I covered that with Dacron. And I compressed that and put that into a Teflon sheath. And to do a nose cone, I put a Fogarty catheter. So I was in uh, with dogs, and uh, with a big dog, an incision, I just placed that inside, and I retrieved the sheath, and then I opened the abdomen of the dog, and uh, it was amazing because everything looked fine. I opened the aorta, and the graft was in position. You, and I thought, from that very moment, this is going to work. So I was absolutely convinced. All I have to do is to refine this, to prove that it's, it's, it's going to work. And it took me you know, a little bit, 14 years, until we did the first case. And the following year, I was so lucky to be invited to come to see a leader in the field and he was the one who showed the, the world that we could change the way we were treating our patient. So uh, Frank invited me, and uh, we did a case very successfully. It was not an easy case, and, and Frank had an old C arm from orthopedic, or the orthopedic surgery, I couldn't barely see anything. But, you know, we were there, and I had one of my assistants uh, near the screen telling me where the wire was. An obese patient with sh shortness of breath couldn't lie down. And uh, the anesthesiologist is, 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 I'm not going to do anything. You have to do it on the local. So one of my assistants was taking the belly of the patient. I was giving local anesthesia. And, um, and finally, uh, we did the case, you know, with my friends, and, uh, and the case went beautifully well. 
Frank, you are known in this country and I guess across the whole world as a visionary man who can really get a feeling of how we how to strategize so the specialty can succeed and basically to get a lot of the credit for us being as successful as we are today. And you had the vision to, edit, to, to find Juan Parodi and to ask him to come here and, and, and work with you in this case. We had this hospital in the Bronx where we had mostly indigent patients with really terrible problems, end-stage disease. Because the patients were so sick, I had uh, developed a relationship with Barry Katzen, who was a preeminent radiologist, and I'd invited him to our New York Cardiovascular Surgery Society when he was a fellow and he spoke on thrombolysis. And uh, because of that, he invited me to his radiology meeting, and, and so I was lucky. I saw what the interventionalists were doing, the radiologists and the cardiologists, and I saw that they were doing things that I felt would be beneficial to our patients. So from the very outset, I was an endovascular enthusiast, and I sent, sponsored our radiologist uh, to go out to daughter to learn how to do daughter angioplasty of iliac arteries because I thought it would be good for our patients, and it was. Then when I heard about what Juan was doing, I said, we've got some terrible aneurysm cases that are so sick that we can't do them. And Mike Marin, who was just out of his training program, was covering for me, and he had one of these patients. He called me up and said, maybe we should go down, because we talked about it a lot, and uh, about doing less invasive aneurysm surgery. And he said, maybe we should go down and see Juan in Argentina. And I said, we got the money for a cheap airfare, we'll go down. And Juan wasn't doing any cases at the time, but he said, well, I'm coming to, to the States. Maybe you can show me the case. But we finally got Juan to say it's a good case. And he and Claudio Schoenholz and the guy who made the grafts came to our uh, hospital. And Juan, you were incorrect about one thing. You said that our... Uh, a fluoroscope in the OR was a reject from orthopedics. It wasn't. It was the fluoroscope that the interventional cardiologists had in their dog lab, and they were throwing it away. <laughs> and so Marin and I went down and got it out of the garbage, and we took it to the OR. So and that was the, the that was the <laughs> instrument that you and Claudio and we used. And the other thing, when Juan and Claudio came to our hospital in the Bronx, this mecca. Mm -hmm. They looked at the operating room, they looked at the fluoroscope, they looked at the OR table, they looked at the technicians, <laughs> the x-ray technician who left when they saw us, <laughs> and they said, we can't do this case. <laughs> and uh, remarkably, that case worked. And then we started following Juan's lead to make our, we made all these grafts ourselves. We didn't have anybody to make them. Marin and I made the grafts with uh, approved stents and approved grafts by sewing them together, and we got various tubes from uh, discards in the OR to make sheaths. And we started using these endografts not only to treat other aneurysms, but to treat everything that we couldn't operate on or treat with a standard balloon angioplasty or stent. My idea was I've got to tell the rest of the vascular world about this because this is the future. It's going to work. It's going to make all our operations obsolete. It wasn't any genius or it was just obvious to me that these crazy cases that we, we would have had to do amputations on or do nothing, um, we were able to save the limbs and, and fix the aneurysms and deal with the trauma. Now, in terms of future, ah. are you concerned that down the line, some of these endografts may not work and, and we may not be ready to, to fix it? I think we need to learn, start uh, thinking about the long term. We are treating younger patients. 
Yeah. Even patient with trauma, you can imagine, uh, 20 year old, is going to, you know, life expectancy is going to be more, more than 50 years. So uh, we still have to work. We are not ready yet. Yeah, but, so but Juan, I'm, I'm a little more optimistic than you. Nothing is perfect when you start. I mean, when we started, we had enormous problems. I mean, we used to joke about the amount of blood loss because our sheaths leaked and so, so forth. And, and we were like the early planes. You know, a lot of them crashed. But as, look where we are now. I mean, the oh, yeah. jets rarely crash. But there are always going to be problems. And one of the things that makes it favorable for us, and the reason I'm more optimistic, mo most of our patients are older to begin with. They're not going to live to forever, and all we're doing is we're making them live longer and better because we fix their lesions uh, temporarily. And at this meeting, we, we had a session, which I'm not sure either of you heard, where uh, the, in the UK they have what they call NICE guidelines which are government guidelines, which are actually retrogressive. They're saying that, that you should do everything open, and they look at the long-term data using old grafts and various other defects in their data, and that it costs more. And I think, as many of the people at that session said, that they're way off base. I think endovascular is going to be the predominant way, even that we, sp we treat young, healthy patients, because they're, none of them are really young. And if we have to do something along the line to fix an early defect, it's better than what we've got otherwise. I, I agree with you. I think uh, we did a lot. I think- and, But uh, it's still developing. It's a big difference. But we still can improve what we Absolutely. do. Absolutely. And I think this is a philosophical attitude. You know, we always can improve. But I agree with you. We reach a point in which uh, we are helping people. No question about it. A lot of our audience are young, upcoming vascular surgeons. I would like our legends here to t give us one advice from you and one advice from you. Well, what advice would you give to the young people who love to be like you one day? They don't have to be like me. They, they can be better than me. And, and I think young people should go into vascular surgery because it's, it's an exciting specialty. We got lots of patients. And all the methods for treating them are, as Juan pointed out, imperfect and can be improved on. I would say that uh, I would tell them this is an open field. There is a lot of room for innovation. And that for young people is, is very, very important. 